Why did you become successful and your friends from high school didn't? Most likely it's because you learned to focus on what was really important and not on what was trivial. Today, Meg, Greg McEwen, speaker and writer, teaches highly successful people like you the disciplined pursuit of less, yes, less, on radio, TV, and at business conferences. Audiences love his English accent and he loves living in America. He wrote a book called Essentialism, and it's been one of the best books I've read in years and completely shifted my mindset. And what's great is that uh, Ethan Willis, where's Ethan? Ethan is here somewhere, uh, actually knows him and made an introduction personally, and then we got to know each other. And in the spirit of less, Greg's title is just one word, which is the name of his book, Essentialism. Please welcome the very bright Greg McEwen. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Now, I wasn't going to share a story, but I've been thinking about it uh, all day, and I, I, I want to share it. Uh, this was uh, one day I got a, an email from my boss at the time, and she said, uh, she said, Friday would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby. <laughs> I want you to think about that. And, and it turned out, in fact, I mean, she was expecting, otherwise that would have been an even weirder email to receive, right? Uh, <laughs> Friday was her due date, and I was in the hospital with her on that Friday, and uh, the reason that this was, uh, she didn't want me to go to this meeting, my boss, is that uh, this was, uh, yeah, she wanted me to go to a client meeting. And uh, so I'm there on the, on the day, on Friday, with my wife, and my daughter's born, they're healthy, it's fine, this is, this is, this is it, right? This is what's important. Uh, but instead of being able to be focused on that, I felt uh, torn. I'm on email, I'm trying to do both, how can I keep both sides happy, you know, and then I remembered, no, I know all about this, I know what's important, I know what matters, and so with all the conviction I could muster, you know, I said, uh, yes, and I went to the meeting. I remember afterwards, my boss at the time said, uh, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. I don't know if that's true, the, the look on their face is not evinced that sort of confidence, uh, but what if it... What if they had? So what? Surely I had made a fool's bargain. Surely I had allowed something non-essential to take the place of something clearly essential. And that was where I learned this simple lesson, which is if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. And out of that grew a question. I mean, let me just put it to you really quickly, right? I mean, that's what I learned, right? But what about you? I want to do a quick poll. I want you to snap if any of these are true for you, right? Snap, we're gonna get a quick poll. Have you ever found yourself stretched too thin at work or at home? Snap for that. Right, I've got some people dancing at the back to this. Um, have you ever found yourself busy but not productive? Snap for that. All right, have you ever found yourself saying yes just to please? Or to appease? Or just to avoid trouble? Right. The question is why? Right? That's a non-trivial question. Why do otherwise successful people find themselves stretched too thin at work or at home? Why? I spent years, I quit my job. That was probably a good idea, wasn't it? <laughs> quit my job, started a new company, and pursued this question with, uh, with, with, with serious passion. Why is it that this happens? And, it, what, and this is what I found, an answer hidden in plain sight. The reason that otherwise successful people find themselves stretched too thin at work or at home is success. Yes. Oh, what's the pattern? Here's the pattern. You get focused. Write few things, right time, put a lot of energy in, generates tremendous momentum, leads to success. Good. What comes with success? New options and opportunities. That's it. That's what we want. That sounds like the right problem to have, but it does, in fact, turn out to be a problem. If it leads to what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. The undisciplined pursuit of more. If you fall into that problem, now I'm exaggerating the point in order to make it, but success can become a catalyst for failure. Like uh, Bill Gates said, uh, success is a very poor teacher. Right, okay, so I'm not anti-success. That would be the wrong place to have such a message, perhaps. But here's what I've learned. I've learned that you have to become successful at success. And it's a different kind of discipline. Uh, in fact, the antidote to the undisciplined pursuit of more is the disciplined pursuit of less but better. 
And, and what we've learned is that as we try to teach this to people, first of all, they just can't do it. Uh, just life is just so fast, so consuming with the non-essential. This is the culture of our times. And so we created a program, a one-year executive development program for slow growth. <laughs> because we know that's what it really takes, a process to change. There's lots of talk about mindset today. To change the mindset from you know, everything that everyone's doing, everything popular now, to the right things at the right time for the right reasons. And, and let me just give you one illustration. Uh, this is a you know, totally true story. Executive in Silicon Valley, doing award-winning work, totally focused. As a result of that, his company gets purchased by a larger, more bureaucratic firm who goes into the new company. And he wants to be a good team player, a good citizen of the new regime, you know. So that means, loosely, he starts saying yes to everyone and everything without really thinking about it. If there's an email chain, he wants to be on it. A conference call, the same. Do you tell me what happened to his stress? Goes up. Uh, but what happens to the quality of his work? Goes down. And there you see the success paradox already at play. And he almost leaves the company in frustration. And then someone gives him some counterintuitive advice. They say, retire in role. Which is different than saying quit, stay, and don't tell anybody. <laughs> we don't need anyone in that scenario. But he said, what if I took a different lens and I experimented with essentialism? What if I asked myself constantly, absurdly, what is essential? Eliminate what's not. Make it as effortless as possible to do the things that matter most. Well, he does this. What happens? He gets fired. Yeah, does he doesn't get fired. He doesn't get fired. It would just change the whole tenor of our conversation if that is what had happened to him. Now, here's what happens. He said, I got my life back. He went to dinner with his wife every night. Went to the gym. He created space at work. And in his work environment, in that space, he found again his creative freedom. And by the end of that year, his performance evaluations have gone up gets one of the largest bonuses of his whole career. What do you make of such a story? Maybe it's just a trick, N equals one, you know. Uh, just one story that illustrates the point I wish to make. Or maybe at play is something foundational, fundamental, universally applicable like this. You can either do a few things superbly well, or you can do many things averagely well. And that that basic trade-off exists everywhere, visually, you can either be pulled in a million directions, the undisciplined pursuit of more, or the alternative to be able to get focused on the right few things at the right time for the right reasons. To figure out, for example, the priority. The priority. Do you know about this? Does anybody know the history of the word priority? It was like you would. But here's the thing. The word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. It was singular. Think of it. It stayed singular for 500 years. I mean, for half a millennium, nobody in any meeting anywhere thought about pluralizing that term. And then in the 1900s, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, somebody decided, look, why don't we just have priorities? Let's just have loads and loads of very first things that you have to do before everything else. <laughs> and yet, with no sense of irony at all, have you not been in a meeting where somebody said, well, here are the 20 priorities? The idea was singular, it was a powerful idea. But to get there, to build there, it's so countercultural. It's a totally different scenario to get into that mindset. If we experiment with the idea of essentialism again and again, we can do something significant. There was a, a, a barrister in England once who might have stayed a barrister, but he had this family emergency come up. And uh, he goes to South Africa because that's where it was. And when he goes to South Africa, he's on the train and he gets kicked off the train because he's Indian and it was in the middle of apartheid. He had a first-class ticket, but they still kicked him off. It was illegal. And so he takes on the South African government. He ended up staying in South Africa for 21 years. And uh, I went recently to his house in South Africa, where he, was, where he was living for those years. He was successful, incidentally, there. We're talking about Mohandas Gandhi. Hmm? When he goes back to India after that 21 years, he's already successful. Everybody wants a piece of him. In fact, when they, he arrives on the train in, South, in, in India, they literally are saying, run for, run for prime minister. We want you to take on the British. <laughs> and uh, he says no. He says, I don't know what's essential yet. I don't know what it is yet. And so he doesn't spend two weeks in some sort of political game pretending to listen, he spends a whole year listening to India. What is the essential thing? And you know what he finds? Salt. This minuscule, but as it turns out, totally vital idea. 
Because the British control the production of salt, they control the production of bread and the whole food chain. And that's when he learns the idea for the salt marches. And he walks across India in civil disobedience to make salt on the beach, and 600,000 Indians follow him, and the British take note. And, uh, you know, he just kept on with these essentialist experiments all the way when his grandson was beaten up in South Africa, once for being too black and once for being too white. They sent him to live with the grandfather, and for an hour a day, for a year and a half, he listened to his grandson, Aaron Gandhi, who I also interviewed. And that was the turning point of his whole life. And we know through a series of essentialist experiments that include prayer, meditation, and fasting, a process that he called, in the only poem he ever wrote, that I read in that house just recently, he said he called the process reducing himself to zero. What he was doing instead was being consumed with a single purpose, the priority of his life, to produce independence for the Indian people, and he achieved it. When he died, the US Secretary of State General George C. Marshall said of him, here is a man who has shown simplicity is more powerful than empires. And Einstein said of him, generations to come will scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. We don't have to be Gandhi. I get that. But doesn't it matter that we figure out to create space to design a life of around the things that really matter most to us, the essential few. Life is fast and full of opportunity, and the complication is that we've been conned into believing we have to do everything. And the impact of that is that we make a millimeter progress in a million directions. I have a position on this, that we can make a different choice, that we can learn over time through slow growth to become essentialists, and as a result of doing that, actually live a life that really matters. Thank you for having me.